Hello, this is Anna Maynard and I'm with the Wisconsin Apple Growers Association. And today we are interviewing Christelle Godot. She is from the Department of Entomology at the University of Wisconsin. She's our fruit crop entomologist and extension specialist. And we're gonna be talking about Japanese beetles, which I'm sure all of you are seeing all over the place right now. So Christelle, tell us a little bit about the Japanese beetle life cycle and their seasonal phenology, so we get a little background. Well, thank you, Anna. I'm very happy to be here and talk to you all about Japanese beetle. I've been giving a lot of talks about Japanese beetle to grape growers, and this is going to be the first one for apple growers. So that's um, there's a lot that we can translate from other cropping systems, so I'll talk about that a little bit. But I just want to give you a little bit of background on the life cycle and seasonal phenology because you might not all be as familiar as our grape growers might be. So for the Japanese beetle, we only have one generation per year. But once we start having emergence, they emerge for a long period of time. Um, and we have them pretty much active from Father's Day. So June 20th, it's pretty consistent. It was the same about this year, all the way until the third week of September. So that's when we see adults. We have emergence that begins about June 20th, and then we continue to see them all the way until then. They lay their eggs in, um, and I, I, sorry, I don't have that picture to show you, but they lay their eggs under turf grass for the most part because the larvae feed on the roots of turf grass and other plants, but that's their preferred host for the larvae. So the female will borrow down about uh, 10 centimeter deep underground and then they'll lay the eggs. So they can go down pretty far. They lay the eggs and then um, those larvae will feed. They stay there. We don't see them until next year. And they'll feed on there. And then when the time comes, their third instar, they'll burrow down even deeper, about 15 centimeters deep. And then that's where they, um, they will overwinter. And so this distance that they are um, um, burrowing down helps them very much get protected from cold temperatures, right? Um, so that's about um, what I wanted to say really about that, about the, the life cycle. And so we see them around that time, like I said, June 20th all the way to um, the end of August is when we have the peak, early July to end of August, the peak activity. And then we still see them into the third week of September. So, so right now, Christelle, are, are they feeding on apple leaves and the fruit or just the leaves? So what you probably have seen is that they feed in prim primarily, but actually entirely on the leaves. We rarely see them, even in grapes, which is interesting, we rarely see them on the fruit themselves. Um, and there's a study that came out just this year on apple where people looked at them in the lab. And actually when they have full apples, the beetles don't even go on the apples. Oh. But if they're cut, then they can feed on the flesh. So they are considered one of those secondary pests that we call, where they will come in if the damage is already done, they might be feeding on the fruit, but if there's no damage, you're not gonna go and, and cause that primary damage. So what we observe, um, and you probably can go out in your orchard and look at those, you can see the, what we call the skeletonizing on the leaves where they feed between the veins, and it, they kind of turn brownish orange, um, they look like they're, um, they're burnt a little bit, but they feed between the veins like that and quite extensively. And so they are, as we can tell, right, they're gregarious. Once you have one, you have more. And there's also, um, so there's chemicals that are produced by the plants that are very attractive and there's a lot of them, but there's also the feeding damage that induces more attractiveness to the Japanese beetle. So once you have some and they're feeding, they'll come back to that area and feed even more in that area. Do they like a particular cultivar or cultivars better than others? Yeah, so there was a study, um, older study, where they looked at different uh, cultivars and actually they also looked at different rootstocks for apple. It's a study that was done, and now I can remember, Arkansas. And so it was at the time, like in the, in the late 90s, where they were starting to have Japanese beetles. So they didn't have, I mean, they had pretty decent pressure. But what they were looking at is what would come into their research station where they had a bunch of different cultivars and then they had gala on different rootstocks and they found differences in the cultivars. So some example, that's why I wanted to look at my note. They tested 66 apple cultivars 
and found that there's different levels of defoliation. And it wasn't clear to me if it was for, I think they did the rating in mid-July, but I wasn't, it wasn't really clear in the paper. But it probably wasn't full season long. But they had, for example, on Zestar, 80% defoliation. On Granny Smith, 26 Golden Delicious, 19%. Jonathan, 15%. And that was higher significantly than Cortland, which only had 6%. So you can see that there are, and we see that in grapes, in blueberry, they have cultural preferences, but never to the point that one has none, right? And so I suspect that oh. even on, out of those 66 cultivars, there wasn't any that was like, oh, there's nothing. Um, they, because they're so polyphagous, they feed on so many different things. Um, they're very broad generalists. Now, when they looked at the rootstocks, so they had gala on different types of rootstocks. And so I asked Amaya if M9 was really like the most common rootstock that we have um, in Wisconsin. And she, she, that, she said, yeah, probably that would be the most common one. And so I looked at that particularly. And so what they found is actually the galas that were on M9s, different types of M9s, had higher levels of defoliation. It was ranging from 70 to 26% compared to say an M27 that only had 9%. So same gala scion, but different rootstocks, and uh, there were differences there that they observed. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's an old study, like I said, and that was kind of looking in the field what was happening, and, but it's, it's really informative, it's really uh, helpful, and that we see that, we see at least from a standpoint of uh, the cultivars, that there are differences in defoliation levels. Um, and then there's a study um, in Minnesota, where they're looking at that currently. Um, and I think, I don't know if you remember, Anna, but we had a student that emailed you and me about a survey. So maybe some of our growers yeah. took that survey. Um, but they're looking at that. They're looking at the cultivar preferences. And we can probably all tell that Honeycrisp is very highly preferred, right? Um, of course right? it is. <laughs> of course. Hey, we like it. They're, they're just like us. They like the good stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I have two little Honeycrisp apple trees. And they're dripping from Japanese beetle right now. So, and it's early. We're very early. So, I suspect this year is going to be uh, a big year for Japanese beetle. But well, time time will tell. Yes. Well, how much defoliation can an apple tree withstand? So that's interesting because I I looked into that, um, and even in a, in a grapes. So I'll talk about grapes too. It's not clear. People have not really assessed that. And in Apple, interestingly enough, if you know that publication, um, How to Go Grow Apples in Wisconsin, yep. Ben Marr, my predecessor, was one of the co-author. And I don't know where he got that from, but he has this in there saying that 10, 15% is a modest defoliation that doesn't affect mature trees or yield. But I don't know okay. where he got that 10 to 15%. Higher levels can stress plants and especially younger plants. Um, as we all know, the more defoliation, the harder it's going to be for them to establish. But then it doesn't say what's a higher level of, in, of defoliation. And so if we think about grapes, for example, which is a plant that, of course, has relies on its foliage quite a bit compared to apple trees. I mean, we have a lot of foliage in an apple tree. Um, I don't know how they compare and how much they need, but just to give you an indication, in, in grape, what we say is 30% defoliation is the threshold that we're using for um, chemical sprays. So if you think about 10 to 15% from that publication from Denmark being okay, and 30% in grapes, and the way they did it in grapes is really they punched holes in the leaves with uh, hole punchers, like you would do on a piece of paper, to mimic 10%, 20%, 30%. And 30% is where they really said, okay, now we are reaching a level that has an impact. So that's what we use with grapes. So I would say, you know, somewhere between that 15% to 30% is going to be kind of a comfort level. But again, it's cosmetic. They're not going to feed on your fruits. So right. where, where do we want that bar to be, that, that level? It's hard to tell because there's no research that has looked at that. It may be something you're looking at in Minnesota currently. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, should we, we be using traps for monitoring or mass trapping? So I don't know if people know about that, but it's well known with people that deal with Japanese beetle. There are traps that are very effective, 
they attract a lot of beetles. The problem where they're not effective is that the beetles don't all make it into the trap. A lot of them get in the vicinity of the trap and then just hang out. And because we're, if you place them in your crop, that's a preferred host, then they'll just cause a lot more damage around that trap. So you do catch a lot, which sounds great, but you're actually drawing them in and not getting them all inside the trap, like you would do a cuddling moth. These are very specific, they work very well, and they get into the trap to get in contact. But it's not the case for Japanese beetle. A lot of them do, but a lot of them don't, and you're really bringing them in. So because of that, we do not recommend to use traps for monitoring and let alone mass trapping. Yeah, yeah, so sounds I, like a yeah, just want people yeah. to make sure that they don't, because a lot of people think about that. The traps work well, why not do mass trapping? And it's not, it wouldn't be using those traps. And if that was to happen, it would be in a different kind of setup. Actually, that's something we're going to look at for, um, for grapes, is looking at putting perimeter uh, insecticidal net with the lures to try to do an attract and kill strategy. But we're not, mass trapping would not be an option. You would just have too much damage around those traps. Okay. Well, what are the cultural and biological controls that we could use for Japanese beetle? So from a cultural control, um, I'm drawing from other crops. And most of the research has been done in blueberry uh, in Michigan. Um, Removing plants that are attractive. So if you have like linden trees, crab apples, things like that, they're very preferred. So that would be something to kind of, if you see those plants that are very attractive, removing them could help. That's not research-based. That's just kind of what we always say as a cultural control. In um, blueberry, and it would be the case in vineyards as well. Remember I mentioned that they are laying eggs in the grassy areas? And we have a lot of that in our alleyways, whether it's blueberry, grape, apple, we have that grassy area. So there's been work in, in Michigan blueberry where they looked at tilling, they looked at cover crops. Um, they, um, let's just talk about those two. So they till those areas or they use cover crops, different types of cover crops, and they do reduce um, the populations because you're changing the environment in which the adults will lay their eggs or where the eggs and larvae are surviving. So tilling is going to move around the, the soil and, and unearth these larvae that are in there. And uh, the um, mulches have helped, the cover crops, I mean, have helped also. Some of them are less attractive. It was kind of a toss up in a way because some are more attractive to or less attractive to the adults that are not the same, that are less attractive for oviposition. So you have more adults where they don't oviposit and you have fewer oviposition where you have adults or where you don't have adults kind of thing. But they do help. Um, so cover crops changing from those grassy alleyways uh, mm -hmm. helps in reducing the population. There's been a study in, in uh, Wisconsin looking at mulches like bark mulch um, or yeah, bark or wood chips and um, the rubber pieces that you have in like playgrounds. Playgrounds, yeah. Yeah, that completely uh, killed all the larval population you could have. There's no larvae laid uh, or no eggs laid, I mean, in those um, rubber mulches that they put there. And in the wood, wood chips type thing, uh, a significant reduction from the grassy um, areas. So they really like that because that's what their larvae are going to feed on, they feed on the roots of the grassy, the grass. And if you have um, larvae that are not very mobile, the female has to really find the right spot to lay the eggs because they're going to stay in that area. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that people have done was cultivation later in the season, in like August, September. That was um, some suggestion in Michigan. Um, that can help unearth again those larvae um, as they're going uh, before they're overwinter and then remove the food for them. One thing that has been done more in turf systems, because uh, there's a lot of work with, with Japanese beetle and turf and ornamentals, because in turf, um, in like if you think about uh, golf courses, you're gonna have a lot of Japanese beetle because that <laughs> grass is perfect. And the cutting height, what they found is that they like to lay their eggs in grass that's less than one and a half inch tall. And that's, you know, irrigated, that's moist, yeah. that's what they like. So golf courses talk about the ideal situation. 
raising the cutting height of that grass more than three inches, suddenly they had a significant reduction in the OV position. Okay. But something to think about if you're somebody that really likes to mow and have that grass short, which in most apple orchards is not so much the case, but um, that's something to think about in letting that grass grow taller than three inches that will reduce the resident population you may have. And also withholding irrigation in the summer until like mid-August on that grassy area so that it's less moist for the females to lay their eggs in. So these are the cultural control methods that um, we're recommending. I don't think that anybody's doing tilling, for example, because that's not something we recommend overall um, from a, um, a systems uh, approach for managing. But but these are some that we can think about. I think cover crops are the ones that would have uh, a very good potential uh, for a Japanese beetle, finding the right cover crops that would deter them from laying eggs there. That doesn't mean though, all this is for larval um, populations, you still have Japanese beetles are gonna fly in, right? So right. Right. it's something to think about. From um, a biological control standpoint, you'll hear all the time about milky spore, there are parasitic wasps, there are nematodes, there are um, um, predators. People have looked at a lot of those, uh, and overall the, the kind of general assumption is that they might all provide a little bit of reduction in the populations, but none of them to the point that it is a control method. So milky spore, the research shows that it doesn't work. It might, it will build up, that bacteria will build up and might provide some kind of relief 10 years down the line or something, but it's never been shown to really be effective as a method where you should invest your money into. Okay. So on the biological control, we're still not doing well on that, unfortunately. We're not there yet. Well, what about chemical control, both conventional and organic? Is there something to use? Yeah, so we have a lot of products and uh, maybe I should make, um, how could I do that? Maybe, let me share my screen so that it will allow people that want to, um, what is this? That want to kind of look at it, be able to um, go back and see this table that I put together. So um, these are um, not by any means an exhaustive list of insecticides. But we have um, insecticides in the organophosphate, imidin, seven in the carbamate. I'll skip the IGR, the insect growth regulator for now. The neonicotinoids, a lot of them are used for the grub management as a soil drench in the late June or, uh, or, or something like that later on. Um, the pyrethroids are also uh, excellent in controlling Japanese beetle. I found some information here on residual activity, um, which was interesting because it's not always easy to find those. So on the pyrethroids, we have a residual activity of seven to 10 days, which is pretty good because you're gonna have more that fly in. So if you have that kind of residual activity, those that are coming in will also get killed, but you have to reapply on a regular basis because more come in. Yeah. Um, then from, a, so those will be from a conventional and that's why I should have moved that IGR below and just, from a standpoint of organic, then we have uh, products such as Paganic is a pyrethrum. So that's the organic version of a pyrethroid. Um, that's organically approved, that works okay. Surround is one that has been shown in different cropping systems to work pretty well as a deterrent for Japanese beetle. So it's that clay, right, the kaolin clay. And so once it's there, the beetles are not, like it's, it's that clay, like you're eating your chalk or something. So it's right. not really palatable and they tend to be repelled by that. But again, we all know what surround does, right? You have to reapply it regularly. It's the fruit grows as the rain, all that. So we have to be um, careful with that. And then this um, Bacillus thuringiensis, this bacteria, the beetle gone, is one that is also a version for the grubs. That is not, none of them are great, but they, they are a good option for um, organic. And then the IGR, the Nemix, you have to have the active ingredient as a directin in there. You have to make sure because that's what carries the weight and some products are called Nemix and, or have neem oil, but they don't have the as a directin. That's what we want. And that also works um, as a contact poison, but also as a kind of a repellent um, from the oil standpoint. So, so these would be our, our organic options 
uh, for growers. Good. That sounds good. Okay. So anything else that we should know? I mean, these have been a lot of good ideas and suggestions. So anything else that we should know about Japanese beetle? I guess the last thing I would say is that um, we, let me stop sharing my screen. We um, always thought for years since I started at least, and they've been introduced in 1916 in the US. They're moving very slow across the states. And we, they're in Minnesota, so they've moved west. Um, but we still see in grapes that kind of gradient where we have more beetles east of, in Wisconsin on the eastern, in the eastern vineyards than the western vineyards. So we still kind of see that progression. But I just learned this year, like not even a month ago, that that cap has now detected established populations in Bayfield. And we always thought that they stopped about Green Bay, or so, and they were not north of that. And I've been telling that to grape growers, like, oh, and often people haven't seen them, but they're on their way to be everywhere. So I would just say, you know, the cold temperatures is not really a limiting factor when you're 15 centimeters deep underground. So, and with the snow cover and everything. So that's all I would say. Like I said, or two, um, I think, but I don't have a crystal ball. That's gonna be a good year for them because we had a pretty mild winter. We have yeah. good snow, co snow coverage. We had a very moist spring. We had um, a warm spring. My numbers here at my house look pretty good right now for them. So <laughs> that's what I would say. <laughs> yes, yes, so everybody's going to be seeing them. I think well, so. Well, thank you so much, Christelle. I appreciate this. I think the growers are going to really uh, appreciate this as well as they try to battle this beetle. Um, and if they want to get a hold of you, an email or um, phone number? Email is better because my phone number, my office, I'm sh of course, I'm not in my office. I'm in my bedroom right now. So um, email would be better. But um, if there's anything, I'm, I check my emails every day. So I'll be able to answer any question that people may have. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you very much. We're you, happy Anna. that Christelle has shared her knowledge with us on Japanese beetles. So thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.